welcome everybody uh, from from my side. I'm the deputy director here at uh, VAV, and I have the the pleasure to to moderate this this final panel before lunch. It's a, difficult one, obviously the last one before lunch. I'm sure uh, you're all hungry and we're also behind time, but I think in the interest of compromise, we maybe take a little bit from the lunch break and, and a little bit of time uh, from, from the panel. So we also have a little bit of a, I should say, a, a, a change to the, to the announced program. Normally in this session, we would present our forecast for Central and Eastern Europe, all 23 uh, countries of the region that uh, we cover. But given the enormous importance of the events we're living through, the, the rupture, as Michael described it, of, of the, the brutal invasion of Ukraine. We decided in the time that we have, which was already not very long, to focus particularly on, on Ukraine this time. I promise we go back to, to the whole region uh, next year. This time we want to look just at the economic development and economic integration, EU integration uh, of uh, Ukraine. Since the war started, uh, it has, of course, the events that have eclipsed really all uh, of the other work that we do. It affects very much the core work we do, the economic forecast, which, which Olga, my colleague, is responsible for, but also a lot of the project and the policy and other, and other work that we do, both what we do at the Institute and what we collaborate with external partners on. And I'm happy to say we also have some external partners here. So the goal of this session will be to present the research that, that, that we have been doing since the war, uh, since the war started. Um, we have our own, so our own Ukrainian-born economists, Olga is one, uh, Marina, I, I see, is, is also here, who have been doing really tremendous work under huge strain that I think the rest of us cannot really uh, imagine and which we really value and appreciate, but also the work that we do with our external partners in Ukraine, which we've developed and, and enhanced uh, since. I will mention them. I think it's fair, even though in the short time we should mention them. We have the Institute for Economic uh, Research and Policy Consultancy in Kiev. Veronika Movchan uh, has joined us from there. Irina is also here, and we're really happy that and, and grateful that you came uh, under difficult conditions from, from Ukraine to be with us. We've also been working with the Groford Institute, especially Tetiana Bogdan, who is a very big part of the research that we will soon be publishing in consultation and cooperation with, with the Bertelsmann Stiftung. We have also cooperated with the Center for Economic Strategy in Kiev, the Kiev School of Economics, and on the EU side, among others, uh, the Bertelsmann Stiftung. Uh, and we're very grateful for the financing that they provide for, for our research and the support in promoting all of the messages, all of the findings uh, to, to an EU audience as well. So, Briefly, I will introduce the speakers and then I will let them speak, which is what you really want to hear. So starting from, from, from the right, we have Miriam Kosmail. She is a senior expert for Eastern Europe and the EU neighborhood at the Bertelsmann Stiftung. She lived in Ukraine for five years, uh, I think, so has a really extensive knowledge and, and insight into this topic and who we work with a lot and we, we really value the cooperation. We have, as I already said, Veronika Movchan. She is the academic director of the Institute for Economic Policy, Research and Policy Consultancy in, in Kiev and a huge expert on U Ukraine's European integration before all of this happened. One of the most cited authors, I think, in the world on DCFDA and the effects of, of the DCFDAs. And then our very own uh, Olga Pinduk, our Ukraine economist who's been looking at the Ukrainian economy for you know, a couple of decades, I think now, and was recently awarded the most accurate Ukraine macroeconomic forecaster in the world, which we are also uh, very proud of. So um, I would ask, as in the previous panel, everybody to make an opening statement about five minutes, and we will start with, uh, with Miriam. I think we've all, as I noticed, um, been under the um, strong impression of the previous panel and um, kind of like uh, changed around our content and notes, um, at least I am. Uh, first, I wish to say uh, one thing I'm thankful um, uh, for, um, and this goes to um, VEEV, but also to this session. I've too often had the feeling that I live and work in two different bubbles, in the Ukraine bubble and in the enlargement EU reform bubble. And I'm very grateful for bringing the bubbles together because that's what um, will make us move forward. I would like to pick it up actually where Michel Glenny left it uh, when he said what gives him hope this morning. Uh, he spoke about ordinary citizens' engagement. Now, if we look at the past 
30 years since independence in Ukraine. Um, these years have been characterized by an increasingly strong will of the ordinary people to transform their country into a modern, liberal, European democracy. Now, you may argue that neither the independence movement, nor the Orange Revolution, nor the Revolution of Dignity have led to that one overall transformative democratic, democratic breakthrough. Yes, this would have been a miracle anyway, but what has happened is all led to remarkable changes and progress, and this in my view is most important, critical societal change. The Ukraine I came to in 2012 is a completely different country from the Ukraine I left with the Revolution and Dignity in 2018, and is a completely different country, I am sure Veronika will um, confirm that, of today. So, the reason is, if I talk about critical societal change, that more and more citizens no longer tolerated being denied civic rights. More and more citizens refused to be instrumentalized by language or by regional difference. And finally, and this I think is the most important point in my view and experience, more and more citizens actually realized they can make a difference in politics and in institutions. Now, this nationwide pattern of, of civic engagement turned into a mutually reinforcing relationship between citizens' everyday acts of contention and their sense of identity, their sense of European identity. Why is this remarkable? Because what we observe there right now is the most important European freedom movement after the Solidarność movement. And will it succeed? Will Ukraine win the war? Here again, Michaleni said this morning rightly, we cannot speculate, but what we can say is that it will depend not only on Ukrainian strength, but also on our support and permanent solidarity. And I also feel, because you had asked me before that panel to give some thought about what is the um, particular value of cooperating also with private foundations and doing research. We value the cooperation with you so much because it is data and evidence based. And I feel there are so many myths and misconceptions about what Ukraine is and can do. We spoke a lot about competitiveness of the European Union today. We did not yet speak about what Ukraine can actually add to this competitiveness. I'm not only talking about the tech sector. Maybe let's also, um, this morning there was um, uh, the um, uh, agricultural problem um, uh, discussed. Yeah, but we did not discuss why France has not been willing to reform the common agricultural policy that is actually also at the heart of the matter. And we are not, well, certainly nobody will argue that Ukrainian agricultural economy itself is not competitive. The, the, the contrary is the case, which is why we had the reactions we had from certain member states. So maybe I, I leave it here and um, uh, look forward to your questions and discussions afterwards. Thank you, Mary. I think some very interesting thoughts, and I think there will, I'm sure there will be some, some questions on that and turning the, the tables and thinking Ukraine is not, cannot or should not be seen as just a burden to the EU, but also what Ukraine can bring and offer in the EU. So, um, Veronica, please. Oh, sorry, Olga. Oh, Olga sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, I would like to 
start by picking on your point about uh, civil participation, civil uh, society building up. I think uh, this is actually at the core of uh, resilience. Uh, this is, has been a word which has been really often used uh, last year uh, describing Ukraine. Because uh, Ukrainian resilience has been nothing short of a miracle, if you will. Uh, not only militarily, but also uh, in terms of economic performance. So, uh, everyone, us, including as the institute, expected that Ukraine would have performed much worse economically, given the circumstances. Uh, but uh, the actual decline of uh, economy last year was less than 30%, and given that 15% of the territory of Ukraine is uh, now currently under occupation or is uh, an active battle zone, and around 15% of population is displaced, given massive bombardments of the Ukrainian energy infrastructure, transport infrastructure, civilian uh, infrastructure, this is quite a remarkable result. And uh, to a large extent, this has been uh, due to resilience of uh, businesses, of entrepreneurs, uh, due to uh, people uh, being united in their efforts. Uh, of course, one shouldn't discard the importance of the uh, help of the Western allies. This wouldn't have happened if it were not for all the financial and military support Ukraine has received. Uh, but uh, actually, this is not a high price to pay for the West, for Ukraine defending the international uh, rule-based order. Uh, Ukraine is willing to fight. Ukraine is willing uh, to conduct business even under these harsh conditions with bombs falling, uh, with uh, fields being uh, covered with landmines. Uh, Ukraine is, remains competitive as uh, recent events uh, in the EU related to the agricultural experts from Ukraine have showed that they actually uh, there are some uh, concerns about the EU competitiveness rather than Ukraine's competitiveness uh, uh, here. Looking forward, uh, yeah, I mean, the war needs to be won. This is a precondition, but uh, I am, as an economist, I cannot really much sp speculate about that. Uh, but in terms of economy, we have reconstruction ahead of us. Uh, the damage uh, to Ukrainian economy is already estimated to be almost at the level of GDP. Reconstruction would require several times that. Uh, but uh, this shouldn't have, uh, be seen as uh, some kind of charity or donation from the West. I think it's very much a win-win situation for the West because it offers uh, ample opportunities to invest for investors who have been starved of this uh, in the low interest rate environment of the last decade. Ukraine has a lot to offer uh, in the medium term. It's a very... Uh, a resource abundant country, uh, be it uh, agricultural land, be it uh, energy. It can be a crucial asset for the green transition of uh, the European continent. Uh, but uh, yeah, it obviously means that the political will has to be there because pragmatically it's beneficial for the EU and the US and all other Western allies to support Ukraine. But the political will uh, sometimes can be not there because of all sorts of political cycle consideration. I cannot stress it more. This has to go farther. Otherwise, uh, I think the European Union will be actually uh, hurt much more in the long run uh, than uh, the costs of supporting Ukraine in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, I think it's it. Thank you very much, Olga. Yeah, and I think we would echo this, this point. I think it's very important about the resilience and this very impressive adaptability, basically, of the economy. Of course, the recession last year was huge, but nowhere near as big as, as had been expected at the start. But I think one of the other questions, and we probably come to this in the question section, is how can Ukraine grow after the war in a different way to before? How much has really permanently changed? Because everybody knows, I think, Ukraine has had this long-term development convergence problem. There's the famous chart showing the difference between Ukraine and Poland's economic development since the early 90s and how much we see a structural change uh, coming out of this and the European integration process to, to, cha to change this, this pattern of development in the future. Before we go to that, um, 
I want to turn to Veronica. As I mentioned at the start, Veronica is really an expert in, in, in economic integration, international economics, and Ukraine's integration long before the war. But of course, all of this question of Ukraine's European economic integration has a huge new relevance and dimension now. So very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. You're like posing much more than I plan to tell. I will, I'll try to react. And... Um, uh, several things and also want to reflect what I already heard at this extremely interesting event uh, and probably starting with Ukrainian resilience before I go into the global competitiveness. Uh, yes, you, you, you should somehow understand, okay, come to Ukraine to understand that Yes, Ukraine is facing huge challenges. The war and the security that will be not only short term, but longer term. Uh, we win this war. We have no other option, but we need the support. But even if we win the war in terms of like entering the year, uh, getting back all the territory, it does not mean that security risk will stop because Russia is still here. So we have these security issues over the years to come not only we as Ukraine, but we as Europe. But also it's a demographic challenges. It is also the need to rebuild and modernize and to change. And it is also the financial challenge. And these are huge, but it's, we should not like, think of Ukraine like a country of ruins. No. We should not think of Ukraine that is we, we should come to the empty land where we will build something in you. Ukraine is a huge country, and even there's a so huge migration and the occupation of territories, we are controlling about 85% uh, of our lands. It's at least uh, 30 million living there, uh, actively working, fighting, and Ukraine is developing. And just a short anecdote, uh, just to illustrate uh, discussion with two people yesterday, one in Kiev. Hey, yeah, it was a forum now, Kiev after three days of heavy drones and missiles attack. We didn't have electricity for four minutes at forum. And the other person here in Russia is uh, sitting in Poland in train, do not have an electricity for one and a half hour. So the train was delayed. That's about resilience and ability to react and reconstruct. Yes, there are cities that are completely destroyed. Yes, its front line is terrible. Yes, we need humanitarian aid for people that are close to fighting. But Ukraine is working. Ukraine is living. The one lesson that I learned, there is no, war, no wartime or peacetime. War is just another dimension that does not cancel anything. Starting from your work, your education, your health issues, and to the rest of the things. And to the European integration. Bad news for those who thought that Ukraine didn't take the commitment seriously. Ukraine did. Ukraine was waiting for matching this commitment of Ukrainian aspiration to become a EU member and EU unwillingness to give even a hint of the promise. Uh, for many years, we were trying to get something out of that. And finally, last year, under the very special, um, un unwanted by Ukraine, actually, circumstances, we would prefer have elusive promise of perspective instead of the full-scale war on our land, to be true. But given the situation, we took the commitment seriously. We took the match between the aspiration of Ukraine and EU commitment, finally, to be a part of the Europe series. And Ukraine is changing. Despite the war, Ukraine has implemented the seven recommendations. There are some peculiarities in discussion, but largely it's, it's, it's happened. Ukraine is adopting food safety standards and adhering them. Ukraine is changing its industrial standards. Ukraine is reforming its sectors. Ukraine is on a full-scale accession path. And Ukraine is begging to give more experts more technological advice to check what we did. One of the issues with the CFTA that we had is that we did, we claim we did, we never know whether we did it correctly because the EU doesn't have a capacity to check. We very much hope that with accession it will change, that we will get the timely, regular, clear 
response over you what we did it, and if we did not do that, what has to be done to correct that? And then Ukraine indeed can a lot to offer. I am economist, actually, not a political scientist as I sound. And uh, basically, it's uh, a lot in the agricultural trade. And yes, the Copenhagen criteria in agriculture, I'm wondering who has to adapt. But, uh, and the main lesson from the April crisis is yes, think globally in terms of agriculture. In you, it will be a fight. But we also have the critical materials that's already discussed, energy. GIT, very good weapon, not full scale, and now we need them, but we were ready to offer the protection and the services of them and the technologies, because with Patriots, um, I might be wrong, but I think Saudi Arabia has also 100 Patriots but cannot hit missiles. Ukraine has much less, and it has 100% efficiency. It means that computer and the operators are much more efficient than just like weapon itself. It, it, it has to be complementary. Ukraine has both. Now, thank God, and we need more. But Ukraine can offer also in medicine devices, in robots, and you. And it's very important. We were discussing China. Actually, I just learned that, and it's ongoing even now, that just labs, Ukrainian labs from Polytechnic are moving fully to China because they offer conditions and they can develop technologies there. Instead of moving to EU, to Poland, to Austria, we, uh, there is a brain drain, high technological brain drain from Ukraine to China, because EU is not offering anything. So we can offer, and it would be good if we jointly win these people back. But we need some conditions. Ukraine has victory and the rule of law. This is ongoing fine. Don't we pretend that no, everything is rosy, pink or something. No, there is an ongoing fight, and we are fighting. Uh, civil society, which we mentioned, is very active in Ukraine, and we are starting to be more and more active in EU to be heard. And only EU, we have hope for continuous military financial aid and insurance. I didn't have time to discuss that, but this is one of the crucial words we will discuss in terms of reconstruction in the coming months and years. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Veronica. You raised a number of extremely important and interesting issues in an impressively short period of time, I would say, and all of these things merit further discussion. Um, we're already into the lunch break, but I want to give everybody the chance to ask a question. I imagine there are quite a lot of questions. Before we go to the questions, I just wanted to mention one thing, because there are many things that we've heard where we have reason to be optimistic and hopeful, whether it's civil society, whether it's institutional development, whether it's the competitiveness of certain sectors and the possibilities that European integration affords. One thing you mentioned briefly, Veronica, which is less optimistic, I think, is, is the demographic story. And we have an excellent paper by our colleague Marina, which will be published very soon, where she looks in great detail at different demographic scenarios. And not to turn back fully to the doom and gloom of the last panel, but on reading this paper under any of the scenarios, it looks quite bleak. And this is going to be a big challenge for, for the reconstruction, certainly. And maybe that's something we can address in the next round. But I would like now to go to the questions. I will gather first four or five hands that I see. First one is already there. And then I, I will gather the questions and, and, and we can answer them as a group. Hi, my name is Marush Karizek, Institute of Economics, Zagreb. So uh, maybe I would like to ask another question regarding the, what we see in Croatia and witness are some very worrisome capital outflows that are happening in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, anecdotal data, not really official data, but we see a lot of um, transactions taking place in the real estate market, in the housing market, we see a lot of uh, Ukrainian entrepreneurs coming to the country in order to establish businesses, specifically in agriculture. And given, I am, I am led to believe that there are capital controls that should prevent, prevent the capital outflow from the country. Is that capital outflow still happening? Do you have any idea what is going on? Are there some estimates? And how do you assess how damaging this could be to the Ukrainian economy, because in Croatia we really see a lot of that happening. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, more questions? 
I'm shocked. <laughs> Everybody wants to have lunch, I guess. Okay, I see one, one back there. Martin Yertl from IHS. <clears throat> Thanks for the discussion. Can you maybe say a little bit more about your outlook, how, like, let's just assume for a second, a little bit optimistic scenario, the uh, reconstruction starts and there's some accession bars to you. Can you just give also maybe a couple of numbers uh, how you assume this catch-up process would look like. Um, as you also mentioned, there would be opportunities for investors. Uh, what can investors imagine there? Um, and probably about the uh, level of living standard um, um, relative to before the outbreak of the war and maybe over the next like five to 10 years. Okay, thank you. I saw one more question over here. My name is Frank Nefke, Complex Design Hub in Vienna. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that I was wondering about is you have talked about what you expect from politicians and also from the population. But what about the private sector? What do you expect from the uh, private sector in the European Union? What do you expect from the private sector in Ukraine in this reconstruction phase? Okay, th okay. One, mo one more question in the middle and then... Uh, <coughs> ah, two, okay, and then one at the back and then th that's it. Ah. Um, can you... Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Olga, the University of Vienna, a PhD student in history. Uh, so I study how Austria was, was, was once occupied by Soviet Union and had to pay reparations and how uh, the Marshall Plan worked here. So my question on both two issues, um, do you see the new Marshall Plan as a source for Ukraine reconstruction? And um, uh, is it the right time for... Um, for said the terminology for war reparation, because before it caused um, some problems for Soviet Union, and um, actually terminology makes sense. So uh, the Marshall Plan and um, the war reparation as a source for <laughs> reconstruction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the last one in the middle here. Um, Hello, my name is Caroline de Guiter. I will reappear in, a, in, a, in one of the next panels. Um, I'm a journalist based in Brussels since a long time. I was talking a couple of weeks ago to a, a high official in the European Commission, in DG Near, you know, being responsible for um, uh, enlargement um, issues. And he said, we are stuck here with an entire directorate general full of technicians who have been working for the past 15, 20 years with instructions, you know, not to be political, not to go too fast and to be extremely strict because we have, in Europe, we have um, enlargement fatigue. Now, he says, everything is, re is becoming again political. So all these people need a complete turnaround of 180 degrees, and we need a lot more people who are, who, you know, because we have to do it fast, and we have to be extremely creative. He said he thought that, you know, despite these uh, bureaucratic um, uh, difficulties and finding the right people, that Ukraine could become a member in five to ten years. My question to you, and I don't know, you don't have to pick it up, <laughs> all, all three of you, but you know, one of you is fine for me. How realistic is this? Thank you. Good, good question. Difficult question. So, um, so we have five questions. Capital outflows, catch-up process and convergence, the role of the private sector from the EU, new Marshall Plan and reparations, and then what is a realistic accession uh, timeline? I would ask you to, a couple of minutes each, pick up which of the questions you want and 
we'll go the same order. So, so Miriam first, please. Okay, thank you all for the questions. Um, I'll start with the probably most difficult one about the timeline. Uh, this is just my personal perception. The timeline of five years, uh, in my view, is not realistic. But that is not the point, because there are solutions on the table. We have already hinted at them this morning. Integration into the internal market, um, gradual accession, and so on. As long as it's credible, that's fine. And this is what is accepted by, in my view, Ukrainian people, institutions. If it is seen that things are moving forward. And I also have the feeling that this is something that has been understood in Brussels. And I'm quite impressed with the commissions uh, and, and particularly with Ursula von der Leyen's um, engagement and statement. I do think that's credible. And um, uh, I do think it's, uh, it's feasible because the EU has also been learning. And um, this morning there was uh, the hint to the EU not being uh, capable without the US to drive pro-democracy forces. Um, I do think in Ukraine after 2013-14, there was a time when reforms were very much IMF dominated and US dominated, but that has changed. There is now the G7. Um, you mentioned the Marshall Plan, um, uh, having established a platform, which um, is also, I think, a good idea because um, uh, and maybe my last sentence before we go into the economic details, we should clearly keep apart the huge amounts of reconstruction money and the costs of EU inst integration, which are two completely separate trajectories. And um, of course they have to dovetail, but the amount, I, I'm saying this because I often um, am confronted with that fear that the EU would be completely um, uh, financially overdoing it by even considering Ukrainian integration. This is because of the war, but it's not integration as uh, in itself. I mean, we, we know the numbers. The Ukraine would increase um, uh, the EU's GDP by 1% and its population by 9%. This is, um, these are more or less the figures of Poland um, uh, a few years ago, which were 2 and 10 percent respectively. So I think we should um, work um, uh, uh, to, to clarify uh, uh, these myths, to have sober assessments. And um, then I think um, uh, the trajectory is, is clear, and maybe one final word, um, I, I cannot comment on the capital outflows, but certainly on the entrepreneurs in Poland. I know specifically a lot of Ukrainians have established themselves. Uh, yes, Ukraine needs these people back, um, but this is why they have to build up an economy that is so promising that these people wish to come back because they don't have to. And this is a common democratic, demographic challenge we face in Europe uh, that um, we all lack um, uh, good people to, um, to keep up the labor force. I leave it here. Thank you. Uh, Olga. Uh, Yes, in terms of capital outflow, I, I don't think this is like really a significant in numbers uh, process. And we need to differentiate whether these are refugees uh, who got temporary protection status and they are opening some business, and uh, really uh, people who are Ill uh, illegally uh, trying to remove capital from Ukraine. But judging by the macro data from the National Bank, uh, national currency is now doing quite well. Uh, the reserves, forex reserves uh, have been growing, uh, and uh, on the cash market there is actually strengthening of, of uh, national currency. So I think it's not so bad doing, uh, there. Uh, Outlook, well, you know, now it's a very ungrateful task to be an uh, economic forecaster because you have to formulate like a very long list of assumptions and one step right, one step left, it's, everything is destroyed. Uh, but if we assume that the war is uh, 
de facto born and uh, security risks are controlled. Uh, there is some insurance scheme in place. Uh, there is uh, proper security at the border. Uh, and uh, then I think we can expect really fast catching up of Ukraine because uh, there is always a silver lining in every situation. And uh, for Ukraine, you know, the war which actually has started 2014, there was already a major destruction of its industrial core, which was painful. But what it allowed to do is actually to restructure the economy, uh, which would have otherwise taken much longer. It wouldn't be that painful, but it would have taken much longer. And Ukraine has now opportunity to leapfrog all these stages of, uh, uh, you know, industrialization, uh, which are not really necessary to uh, to do anymore. It doesn't need to repeat mistakes of Central Eastern Europe in attracting FDI at all costs, at any cost. So. Uh, having a good uh, base of hu uh, skilled human uh, resources, uh, demographic uh, problem aside, uh, having uh, good technologies, uh, having good resources, uh, Ukraine can be actually, uh, you know, counting with double-digit growth in, in terms of catching up for several years. Uh, it can be another, you know, tiger, but European one. Uh, being optimistic, yeah. Uh, so numbers, uh, I, I wouldn't put. I mean, in the current year, I only th uh, think that there will be a very tiny positive growth, a couple of percent, uh, but uh, going forward, uh, yeah, it can be sluggish, it can be double digit, it all depends. Um, private sector, uh, in terms of expectations in the EU and Ukraine, I know that Ukrainian government is actually already very active in trying to court investors. There is a lot going on at the governmental level, uh, and risks at the moment are too high, but the rewards are really very high potential for those who can uh, you know, accept the risk uh, associated with the project. Veronica already mentioned how important um, inter international insurance is. So if this is in place and there is more certainty about the war outcome, you know, time-wise, uh, I think there will be huge interest of different investors. There was already actually quite many companies uh, coming for the rare earth materials, uh, but where, of course, uh, this has stopped uh, or rather paused because of the war. And uh, Marshall Plan, reparations, these are all active words being used now. I think not so much Marshall Plan, I think uh, this is more associated with the Second World War, but some kind of uh, investment plan is being widely discussed. Nothing concrete yet, unfortunately, uh, but reparations, a lot of work has been going on. Legally, is a very tricky issue, but as has been some progress, slow, but uh, you know, as uh, that nothing happens overnight. And uh, talking about Ukraine, you know, that in 30 years it hasn't achieved what ha Poland has achieved. Uh, circumstances are much more difficult than case of Ukraine. But one, uh, but it would be really wrong to say that there hasn't been progress. Progress, if you look back and consider all the headwinds Ukraine had to face in terms of. Uh, very aggressive neighbor because uh, Russia has been uh, trying to interfere and prevent Ukraine from developing. You know, it's not only 2014 when the war starts. It's, I remember already early 2000s, uh, endless trade wars, endless use of energy as a weapon to trying to influence political decisions in Ukraine. And uh, has been tough, but we are going forward, we are moving and progressing. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Olga. So, last word to, to Veronica. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to Miriam and Olga for, for already taking a lot of hard questions, so I can be a bit of cherry-picking. And uh, with uh, response to this Ukraine-Poland uh, comparison, we should not forget that Poland had property rights, private property rights, always in the country. And Ukrainians were denied of any right of land property, house property, even doing some small businesses was a speculation and you are in jail. We should not be very like <laughs> tough on Ukraine comparing these starting conditions. It's not only about the level of GDP. And about uh, capital, just to add one word, we should not be worried of businesses opening in EU by Ukrainians now. It means that they are 
now producing some value added and probably sending something back or employing people who left. And there will be new links and much more intensive links as soon as uh, the security situation uh, allows. Capital controls are in place. There is no major capital outflow, a part of the uh, a lot of uh, travel spendings. Now, uh, imports of, tr uh, of travel expenditures is, is, is huge because it's about 5 million Ukrainians in Europe, at, at least. Uh, and uh, about uh, reparations, yeah, that's, that's the make Russia pay for that. That's only very high in the Ukrainian agenda. And now what is most challenging and interesting for me, how long does it take to join the EU? Uh, my benchmark, my very personal benchmark is about uh, 2030. I was said that it should be 2029 because of like political cycle in the EU, but that's, that's my understanding. Uh, Ukraine is very serious. The society is highly consolidated. The government is working on that. It's not their only priority because winning the war is, is number one or zero or ground, but still, and uh, businesses and civil society is helping. And Ukrainian uh, government, how to overcome the capacity difficulties is to come to the civil society for the active help at all levels, starting from legal analysis and proposal of changes to advocacy campaigns in Ukraine and in the EU uh, for all we need. So I am cautiously optimistic and I'm afraid you will hear Ukrainians advocating for EU enlargement much more loudly in the coming years. I don't know how loud it was Western Balkans, sorry I missed that. But Ukrainians are vocal. I agree with previous <laughs> speaker. That's all from, from me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you to all of you. We went quite far into your lunch break. I, I'm sorry for that, but this was important. Um, I want to thank all the speakers, great contributions. I, I won't even try to summarize it, um, but thanks for being with us and offering this food for thought, which we can discuss at lunchtime. If you don't mind me saying special thank you to Veronica for coming from Ukraine uh, to, to be with us. And um, Maltzeit, see, see you back here after lunch.